part of the problem that we have here is we keep indulging Russia and Putin, the people around him, in their narratives of history. So thank you very much for coming to the interview here today. Um, so starting quite general, um, why do you think many people in the West have sort of misunderstood Putin and his, his uh, way of thinking about the world? I think there are many reasons for that, honestly. And part of it now is that he's been there for so long that he's almost become kind of part of the scenery for people, which might sound a bit absurd, but I mean, I think he's been in office for 23 years. And at the beginning, he was a mystery and people still kind of think to themselves there's a bit of mysterious uh, attributes there that they probably don't understand. But I mean, 23 years in plain sight, I mean, we actually know quite a lot about him. But I think that, you know, one of uh, the fundamental reasons is that at the top level of governments in the United Kingdom, in the United States and across Europe, people change all the time. So in a way, we keep losing the plot, at least politically. So you know, the average person like, you know, you and I and others who are interested in Russia might have been following Putin, you know, for 20 odd years and know quite a lot about him. I mean, I've written a book about him. So, yeah, I've been following him for quite a long time. But people in government come and go. And you know, in a way, they keep kind of losing the thread and they keep coming back and reinterpreting him. And he himself is something of a deliberate political chameleon. You know, he kind of changes his appearances in a way and his whole attitudes to sort of suit the person that he's meeting with. I mean, this is deliberate because, of course, he was in the KGB, in the security services. It's his job to dissemble. It's his job to manipulate people, to exploit their vulnerabilities. And, you know, he often, you know, presents himself differently. Now, I think over the last few years, what people have perhaps not realised is that, I don't know whether he's changed dramatically, but he's evolved and hardened. Because after 23 years in power, power of course will corrupt, power of course will change you. You know, he, he's lost a lot of the pragmatism that he might have had early on. And he started to think of himself as the indispensable figure in Russian history. Mm. And he's going to shortly be one of the longest serving Russian leaders historically, you know, with the exception of people like Stalin yeah. and, you know, some of, uh, some of the czars. And he's kind of moved into this phase of being a legend in his own lifetime, of being a historical figure, and he thinks about himself in that way. And I think that's probably the thing that people have misunderstood the most, is that he's kind of morphed into this um, self-referential mm. historical figure. He has started to think of himself in these historical terms, and it's kind of warped his sense of reality. He's very much cut off in ways that... And you know, he probably wasn't in the past from, you know, even the country and the people uh, that he's you know, purporting to rule over. And I say rule over because he starts to think of himself now as a czar, as a kind of modern incarnation of some of his historical heroes like Peter the Great and even Catherine the Great. I think the historical parallel and this historical uh, reflection is very important there. So how do you think that this, this notion of Putin as someone who's placing himself amongst the greats of Russian history, amongst the... Um, the kind of imperial rulers of old. If we, if we were to keep that in mind, or if we're Western European leaders were to keep that in mind when engaging with him in geopolitical negotiation and so on, you know, what practically would that look like for them? How, how would one respond differently to him, say, than various leaders of the Western world have already? Well, look, I mean, we're all looking at the moment after the invasion of Ukraine for some kind of solution here, which looks like practical, pragmatic, uh, on you know, the basis that there must be some rational basis of compromise. The problem is that Putin is living in a different historical narrative from everyone else. Yeah. And in a way, we're battling for history, which, of course, is impossible. Yeah. Because everybody has their own narratives of history. Um, there are some you know, pretty basic objective facts, but there's always these different interpretations of history. And history looks very different from everyone's perspective. And we were sitting on, in, in Hay on Why on the border between England and Wales. And British history looks very different if you're Welsh, and it looks very different if you're English. You know, so think about that in the Russian Empire on a vast scale. And Putin is always reinterpreting the past and on his terms. And in fact, he's even outlawed different interpretations of different historical periods for Russia, including World War II. Right. So that makes it very difficult to find a common ground and a basic understanding for negotiations. And I think actually we have to push back against these narratives because in many respects, we in the West and uh, elsewhere in the world have fed this war by taking Putin's historical narratives at face value. Let me just say you know, a word or two about this. You know, first of all, Russia remains an empire, an imperial state. 
it still includes within its borders uh, areas that were absorbed over centuries of expansion. And, you know, we fail to recognize that when you had the collapse of the Soviet Union, or the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991, that was really the second iteration of the Russian Empire. Because uh, the Bolsheviks uh, basically had to recognize that some uh, territories like Finland and Poland and the Baltic states uh, had got their independence uh, from, from Russia after the revolution and the civil war. But under the Soviet period, fast forwarding to Stalin, Stalin took a lot of this territory back again. He re-seized the Baltic states. We never recognized them as being incorporated. He tried to take Finland back and the Finns fought back in 1939, but they lost a bunch of territory. And of course, then after World War II, Poland, Hungary and a whole host of other um, Eastern European countries that had never been part of uh, the Russian Empire uh, fell under the Soviet yeah, bloc. Yeah, yeah. And so um, in Russia um, today, having been recognized as the successor state to the Soviet Union, people like Putin, the cohort of people around him who grew up in the Soviet Union, who was steeped in Russian history, tend to think that Russia has a right of to have a sphere of influence and a right of authority over all of these other states, either those that were formerly part of the Russian Empire and those that were in the Soviet bloc after World War II. And people indulge that. We still say, well, the United States or the West is at fault for expanding NATO because we moved into Russia's sphere of influence. And I would say, hang on a second, do we really think in the 21st century that countries should still have spheres of influence? The United States shouldn't have one. I mean, the, there's a view in the Russian state, uh, not just Putin's, but widely shared that the United States is still an occupying force in Europe and it's mm, still the imperial mm. force in Europe from their viewpoint. Yeah. Now, of course, Europeans would think very differently. The United Kingdom obviously doesn't see that the United States is sort of the imperial power um, in Europe. And, you know, the United Kingdom has had its own throws of imperialism and post-imperialism and all kinds of problems like the Suez crisis 1956, you know, for example. So most states have been trying to move on, move away from uh, the imperial age, move away from, uh, you know, colonialism. But Russia is actually still persisting in this. And because we recognized Russia as the successor state to the Soviet Union and then essentially the Russian Empire, we have given Russia this kind of right to make these expansive claims. And that is, you know, part of our problem here. And again, you know, people are always saying, well, of course, Ukraine was part of, of Russia. Well, it wasn't, you know, for large periods of history. You know, Wales was somewhat independent, you know, up until, you know, various centuries of English expansion. There's, a, there's always a history and a different historical period to look at. And so I said, you know, part of the problem that we have here is we keep indulging Russia and Putin, the people around him, in their narratives of history. So be able to get to a negotiating table get to some kind of resolution, we have to, in a way, demilitarize this history. We have to push back against it because we have to move forward. If we keep going back into history and making claims against other countries and other peoples and other regions, I mean, uh, there really is no end to this. I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I grew yeah. up in Northern England where, you know, the Roman Empire was. So yeah. should we go back to Rome? I mean, they certainly predate, you know, a lot of other English history. Yeah, the the yeah, Romans yeah, yeah. were there first, you know, kind of thing, if you if you start playing this out. You know, so so we have to... I, as I actually say, look, no, this is not going to work. We cannot have any kind of negotiation or resolution here that is basically satisfying one group's view of history. So this leads to quite an interesting question about how current events are interpreted as part of a history, as part of a historical narrative. So one of the interesting comparisons that's been made between Putin and Donald Trump was... Um, this idea that um, how the facts actually were was like less relevant than how the presentation was, was going to come across, right? To the extent that some people um, would mention Frankfurt's idea of bullshit and, and say, you know, this is a, a new era of politics, an era of politics in which, you know, you can just fly in the face of facts. But I think maybe a more subtle interpretation comes from that understanding that actually it's not just some random interpretation, is it? It's an interpretation that's come from a line of history, a narrative of history, where the present fits into that narrative. And what you think of the historical narrative is going to dictate how you take the event of today or yesterday. That's right. Um, and so if we're going to try and come to the negotiation table and we're going to 
as you say, have to bring up the fact that one narrative of history has been running the negotiations. How do we successfully change that? I mean, what, what, what can we say to really bring out the question that there are other narratives, that in fact, you know, imperial Russia isn't the only narrative in Europe? Well, how, as a practical matter, how, how do it's we do that? It's going to be very difficult. I mean, look, on, on the way up to the war, there were actually all kinds of different commissions, including, you know, the Russians having them with the Poles and the Germans and others, you know, to talk about, you know, their various differences and all the historical baggage. I mean, whether we like it or not, we can't be a historical because we live with the weight of history. It shapes us. I mean, just as human beings, we shape by that. We have a lot of great things going on here at Hay on Why about how attitudes are shaped. There's a lot of research now. They're even showing, you know, your DNA, which is, of course, is the genetic history that we have going back to our forebears, really kind of shapes sometimes even your attitudes, kind of things that you're interested in, which would seem kind of counterintuitive, but we can't just slough all of this off. Right. And, and the um, important thing is to try to establish some kind of base on at least agreement that we're not going to be dictated by different uh, groups interpretations of history and finding a way forward now it's going to be obviously very hard but i think that has to be a debate on a much larger scale and right. you know in, in many respects it's going to be very hard for countries like the united states and the uk because we have an awful lot of baggage but there are you know other countries with different kind of histories that could play a role in here and could push you know forward to the negotiating table you can see for example that Zelensky himself uh, president Zelensky of ukraine that is has picked up on this you know he's been traveling around all over the place, talking to different uh, countries with different interpretations of history, different perspectives here, and basically saying what Ukraine is trying to do is fight for its independence, for Ukrainians' rights to just talk about their own future and have their own future, not be dragged back into somebody's past. Because what Putin is trying to do is drag Ukraine back into Russia's past and making the past dis di dictate the present and then shape the future. And you know that was the whole uh, premise of you know, previous politics that we tried to cast off after World War II. I mean, I've made the argument in different formats that this is going to, you know, in a way, World War Three in a structural sense, because it's kind of fighting again for the territorial disposition of uh, Europe, as we did in World War One and World War Two, and people's rights to define themselves as they want to be defined. I'm not trying to get into identity and culture wars here, mm. but people wanting to, you know, basically have their own governance in their own, um, you know, statehood, self-determination, you know, however we want to, you know, basically call that, but the right for people to determine their own future, not have somebody dictate it for them. I mean, this is all of the debates that we're having in society at the moment. So we have to find a way of finding a political baseline here. And I think that that involves more parties being brought to the table with all kinds of different perspectives. And we just have to you know, resist that idea that because Ukrainians speak Russian or lots of Ukrainians have spoken Russian, they are Russian, that determinism. You know, if we go into Wales and people are speaking English but identify themselves as Welsh, why are they not Welsh? You don't have to be just... Uh, a Welsh speaker to be Welsh. Your, your roots may go back a long time, but you know your family uh, have, have become dominantly English speaking. If everyone in the world who spoke English was English, it would be a very different planet that we'd all be living on. You know, so I think that's you know kind of part of. We have to speak out about this, and we have to make common cause with a larger you know kind of group of countries and peoples. You know who want to emphasise sovereignty, territorial in integrity, and the ability of people to move forward into a future that they're shaping, not being you know, dragged back into a past that's then determining where they can go. I mean, I think the, the mention of bringing in other parties is really crucial here, right? Because so the kind of narratives that are at stake and the kind of narratives that are influencing today's negotiations, today's politics, are post-Second World War European sort of, and including America, narratives. Um, and even, even some of the virtues which I think we still generally hold as important, things like, you know, um, national sovereignty, self-determination, the ability to talk about your own future and your own past as a country. Um, even those are quite post-Second World War kind of values. They are, well, or post-Treaty uh, of Westphalia, exactly. I mean, we, we, we again prisoners of, of the past to some degree, yeah. like you're saying, yeah. And, and so, but there are obviously lots of other nations who, who you know, weren't at the forming of NATO, uh, who weren't exactly. at the formation yeah. of these large international bodies that Including play, the UN even, yeah. Yeah, yeah, including the UN, that play big roles in politics today. And, I mean, some of those countries have decided that, um, you know, non-alignment is the best way for them to interact right, with this right. issue. This, the, the invasion of Ukraine and the more general issue about yes, how exactly. Russia sees itself in Europe. 
how are we, I mean, should we be bringing them to the table to, to this discussion of history and current, that how that affects current events? I mean, how do we interact with people who've decided, look, this is, you well, know, we're not look, aligning? I, I think we should in terms of trying to find a, a way out of this absolute disaster. Right. Because, you know, whether, you know, they want to be part of it or not, uh, the, 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 the war in Ukraine and they certainly don't want to take sides. You know, we can list off all of the kind of countries, there's a heck of a lot of them, <laughs> who fall into that category. They are affected by it. Yeah. Uh, I think everybody now is aware of Ukraine's incredible role in terms of feeding the world, literally. And, you know, if you look at the potential crop yields from Ukraine in this coming year because of what's actually happened as a result of the war itself and the destruction of a, you know, a sizable percentage of Ukraine's ag um, arable land. And we're not just talking about the Black Sea uh, grain blockade for exports of grain that uh, you know, the Russians have imposed, but we're actually looking at what's happened to you know, Ukraine's uh, land and then potential crop yields. Between 10 and 20 million people could die because of this. Because in other parts of the world, if they have a crop failure, you know, they can't substitute. And I said between 10 and 20. So that means that you know, no matter what, we're going to have deaths from famine, hunger, uh, you know, malnutrition, you know, you name it, basically because of uh, Ukraine being kind of taken out of the picture to a large extent. So we need to get, you know, Ukraine back on board as a major agricultural producer and exporter for the rest of the world. There's all the other knock-on effects, through sanctions and everything else that's happened that's, you know, affecting food prices, inflation. You know, we saw all of that, obviously, in the earlier parts of the war with winter and fuel prices spiking. Some of this is kind of evening out now. But it has affected other countries and will affect some of them acutely. So there is here an incentive and an interest in getting involved in somewhere to find a resolution. But we have to then find a resolution that doesn't set a negative precedent. Right. And that's where this comes in for other countries that, again, don't want to be aligned. They certainly don't want to take sides. They don't want to get caught in a kind of a clash between the US and China, for example, or the US and Russia, and which is another reason for why it shouldn't be just driven by the US or for you, by Europe. But, you know, they want to make sure that their own territorial integrity and independence is not compromised by this. And you're absolutely right. They didn't feel like the international institutions have been working for them, although there is a great deal of interest in beefing up the UN General Assembly and its various mechanisms. Right. That's where the UN grain dealers come out to, you know, try to get the World Food Programme and other institutions getting grain out to the places that it's needed. But there is an interest in trying to find, you know, a resolution that sets a healthy precedent for the future and reduces the risk that other countries that are vulnerable to larger neighbours, especially those that might be nuclear powers, are not going to be compromised in some way by this. But yeah. so that's the tricky thing. So what are the mechanisms? And, you know, I've obviously been thinking about this as well. If we see the UN grain deal, that was an important you know, role that the UN could play. There are other mechanisms. For example, the Russians have been absolutely devastating in their approach to civilian nuclear power, not just threatening nuclear arm again with tactical or intermediate range nuclear weapons, but actually holding nuclear power stations hostage and shelling them, going through the Chernobyl exclusion zone, Zaporizhia, the largest nuclear plant in Europe, every day being, at, uh, being held at risk by uh, Russian military activity. And we've seen the UN intervene there as well, the International Atomic Energy Agency. You know, we've seen the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court and others play different roles. But a lot of countries are supportive of those kinds of roles to the UN because they want to see more attention to their concerns as well. And if that could come out of the war with Ukraine, more attention to climate change, regional and you know, economic development, debt relief, mechanisms that would protect you know, them from predation, military and political, then I think you know, countries would sign up for some kind of effort. But if it's again going to be the great powers, like in World War I and World War II, just sitting about in you know, various places behind conference tables, signing away you know, the future of Europe or you know, the world future, that's not what most countries want to see. And you're seeing that reflect at the elite level and also at the popular level. So we've got to think long and hard about how you bring in countries that would otherwise not want to be aligned in particular blocks. That's fascinating. Thank you. So obviously you've been privy to some of the characters that we see on the news. You've spoken to world leaders. You've, you've, you've seen how these people think sometimes firsthand. Um, yeah. What, what are some of the most valuable lessons that you've personally gained from those interactions? Well, I mean, sometimes they're very cautionary tales because, right. you know, you really kind of see the limits um, and, uh, many of our leaders, you know, today. I mean, I've seen some pretty inspirational, you know, people as well at first hand. But, you know, there's only so much one individual can do. And I think, that, you know, the biggest risks that we have 
in today's politics is the personalization of politics. Right. And we see the strongman phenomenon, you know, on every frontier. I mean, lots of books being, you know, written about this, you know, for example, and it's, it's a feature of our time. Because, you know, when you have a time of rapid change, people really can't keep up and they're kind of looking for some mechanism to say, stop the world, I want to get off, or stop the world, I don't want it to change anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's very easy for individuals to um, uh, come forward in that regard and present themselves as champions, you know, the populist leader. But, you know, they're very limited. And so, I mean, the things that I've learned the most is just this importance of having checks and balances in the system. And also, to be honest, the, the power of people power. I mean, we've, we've all got ourselves to you know, be instead of followers, be more uh, active um, and, you know, think about actions that we can take. And, you know, what uh, the best leaders are those who actually listen to other people and really take their advice on board. But we also have to, again, understand the limitations of the political systems that we're in. People are always blaming, you know, the US for this or, you know, the UK for that. And, you know, our systems themselves are quite limited in the information that gets brought forward. I mean, it's extraordinarily important to try to find you know, again, mechanisms of openness so that information comes in. Because you're only as good as the things that you know. And, you know, the advice that you can, uh, you can take on board. Uh, you know, and I've, again, I've learned, you know, how important it is to have good analysis, to have objective analysis, you know, to basically bring that forward to, to help people uh, make decisions. But there is also then, you know, the importance of speaking out when things take you know, pretty, a turn. Uh, pretty negative turn. Yeah. But, you know, uh, this is a moment where all of our politics, you know, kind of across the world are, are really jeopardized by this kind of idea that strong men, populist politicians can really resolve things. And you know, really what we do, we do need is more kind of grassroots action and figuring out other ways of giving people, you know, stakes, uh, stakes in the system. And I mean, I've, I've taken all that away from, you know, being on the inside and seeing really the limitations. Right. But I've also seen... You know, how much things can be done by small numbers of dedicated people, you know, have a shared sense of mission and of responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. So I would also, you know, kind of um, uh, make an appeal for, you know, thinking more positively about public service and civil service of, you know, all kinds of uh, a different, uh, a different levels. Because, again, you know, governance is only as good as the people who get involved in it. Brilliant. Well, Fiona, thank you very much.